are off. Hello, my name is Brad Bodnerchuk, and welcome to the Half a Dozen Hospitality Podcast, where we discuss everything hospitality, from the food on the plate to the teams that make it happen, and the community that drives this industry forward. On this podcast, we sit down and chat with some of the most exciting, inspiring, and innovative minds that make up one of the most dynamic industries that there is today. And today, I have the pleasure of being joined by none other than Hakan Burjolu. Welcome to the show, sir. It's nice being here, man. Thank you. My absolute pleasure hosting you. Let's just dive right into it. We came, it. we came together uh, through a mutual friend who's kind of said, you guys need to meet. Mm-hmm. And admittedly, you were, you were on my radar because I had seen and heard about this book, which we'll get into today, which is kind of the reason why you're here, to mm-hmm. be honest. And I had seen on social media, through people that I follow and people that I'm friends with, this event that was going on here locally in Vancouver that was basically the... Well, I'll just call it for lack of a better term, like the launch party, the release party of this book. Fill in the gaps of how this book, what this book is, came to be. Let me know more. Let the listeners know more what this is for you and, and why this even exists. Yeah, sure. I mean, I think I, I guess I have to start by talking about my magazine a little bit. I, I run an online platform. We call it a magazine, but it's a digital magazine mm. uh, called The Curatorialist. And it's a platform that, you know, uh, where we cover chronicle chefs and industry people, and now it's kind of branched out into covering artists as well. So, you know, I've always had bones to pick with mainstream media and whatever, uh, and this was a way, without any money interest, to get into these people's lives, have a chat, and the subtext was always to make friends in this industry, right? Mm-hmm. Just like you, right? You know? 100%. Um, so, it, so, I mean, my point is that I wanted to publish in print for a very long time. It was one of my biggest dreams to, to have you know everything so digital and so fast food and so easily consumed and fastly consumed that I wanted something to like hold in my hand and be like, I did this. Mm-hmm. And I've had this burning desire for a long time. So I was interviewing Mark Brand of Save On Meats. And, uh, and one day, and my style is that I interview people over many, many weeks. Um, and I spend a lot of time with them. I kind of like get into their private lives. You know, they, they invite me over to their homes and stuff. And, and I always tell them, if you're going to go shop for groceries, if you're taking <laughs> your kids out to a lake, if you're taking your dog to a dog park, give me a call and I'll take some candid photos. Cause I hate staging stuff. Yeah. You know, it's not the way I like doing things. So one day he called me and he's like, dude, I'm in my car. I'm going to West Vancouver. Uh, there are these publishers who want to, you know, a newfound publishing company Mm -hmm. and they want to publish a book. They want to make a book for Save On Meats. They want to donate a hundred percent of the profits to us. Like, would you just be interested in coming and like shadowing me and taking pictures? And I was like, dude, let's do it. So I took pictures of him driving a car. (laughs) He had like three, four separate conference calls in the car. He was talking to these uh, professors in LA. And um, so I'm just taking pictures, like totally silent. So Mm -hmm. we, we, you know, we come upon this house and uh, he's having a photo shoot with uh, the children of the publisher. Um, and, and, that's, and they're talking about this book. They're talking about how they're going to make it happen, uh, what's going on with it and whatever. And on the drive back into, the, back into town, I asked him, like, I was like, dude, do you guys have a, an author or a photographer for this? And he's like, I don't think so. Like, we're looking for one. Mm-hmm. So later that night, I kind of gathered my thoughts and I volunteered my efforts. And... Uh, And then we had a couple of meetings with the publishers and with Mark himself. And Mark's like never in town anyway. So I kind of picked it up and then I started seeing the publishers more. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I, you know, I guess the, the ethos that we both harbored for this project aligned. And my vision for this book was, was to make uh, a book that transcended being an object of charity. Because, you, know, uh, you know, I donate to charity as well sometimes, and, and you get these, like, free tchotchkes and shit, and I'm like, <laughs> I hate, I just, you know, it's like, it's not, you know, design is not, like, the priority of right. these objects that you receive as a token for your, 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 your donation, so mm-hmm. to speak. Mm-hmm. So I wanted to make something that kind of rivaled a coffee table book. I knew that with the, with the budget in mind, that wouldn't be necessarily possible. 
but I wanted to do something with a magazine aesthetic because I run a magazine. I wanted to do something that brandished like hundreds of photos. And basically, I wanted to compile something that was like 20 Rolling Stones interviews from the, like the 80s or 90s. Right. So just in the same vein. So this is very much like a cross-pollinated publication in the same vein as my, as my platform. And um, 20 chefs, actually 21 chefs, because there's uh, uh, Makoto and Amanda. They're mm -hmm. a couple, and they right. run Mak and Ming in Kitsilano. Shout out. So 21, yeah, shout out. And um, 21 chefs. Uh, you know, an almost 160, 170 page book. And uh, basically, also, I was like, I sat down with my wife and we brainstormed about, like, how are we going to structure this book? Mm -hmm. Because compilation cookbooks, I love them. I own all of them, pretty much. <laughs> but I also hate them. Because, like, the only common denominator, the monofilament that runs through these publications is that they're just a bunch of chefs from the same city. Right. They have nothing in common. So I was like, how are we going to do this? And I'm not a guy that says like chapter one, breakfast, chapter two, <laughs> mains, you know what I mean? Chapter nine, cocktails. <laughs> so I was like, you know, um, fuck that. I was like, let's, let's do it in a way where let's plug story. Let's pl plug Providence. Mm -hmm. And that, that was something that really gelled with the charity and nourishment aspect of this anyway. So very colorful stories. So I asked people a very simple question. That was my starting point. And the question was, um, if you could choose one dish from your provenance, from a staff meal, from your life, what would it be and what would it look like on a plate? Mm -hmm. And then they just filled in the gaps. And it, it was never a consideration of, oh, man, we have two soups back to back. Right. And these are, these are serious considerations of publishers, right? For sure. They're yeah. like, it's soup heavy. It's yeah. bread heavy. <laughs> Uh, and, and thankfully, we don't have two breads or two soups or whatever. It just worked out that way. Mm -hmm. um, but they're just, I, I guess, the, the, the common denominator for all the recipes is, first of all, very few ingredients, utterly delicious, very nutritious. Uh, and, and the most important thing that I tell people with this book specifically is cook from story, not from recipe. So, you know, there's 20 stories that accompany all the chapters. And their stories about, and, and most of the, you know, most of the stories, like the, the chefs are, are, you know, um, they're going on record for the first time about these really private memories from mm -hmm. their childhood. Mm -hmm. And most of them grew up, most of them came from very, very humble beginnings and n not necessarily things they've shared before publicly. So that's all in the book. So if there's a story you like, uh, if there's a chef that you think you have something in common with, cook his or her recipe is right. what I'm trying to tell you. Right. So that's really the ethos of the book. And other than that, design-wise, my, uh, you know, and I did this like totally pro bono, zero dollars an hour uh, mm -hmm. for eight months. Uh, it, and it's a huge passion project and I, and I, and I loved every moment of it. And uh, we we're like, okay, so who's going to design this? Because, you know, um, there aren't a lot of designers that are going to you know, work, just do it, just do it. Right. Yeah. So I, I had, thankfully I had a couple of friends in Turkey in Istanbul, which is where I'm from. And, uh, they did it like pretty much for free. Wow. Uh, and they did an amazing job. It's just, uh, you know, colorful stories. The thing is like you, you first, you go out and interview, you, you go out into the world and you talk to these people and then, and then something whispers into your ear. This is what I want to look like. So the book is very colorful, and we made it colorful. Right. You know, the chapters are color-coded. <clears throat> the, there's pictures, you know, tons of you know, pictures of people's pets, children, you know, objects of desire. Do and you know, uh, sorry, do you know Todd Selby? No, I don't. So Todd Selby is a photographer and storyteller. And as you're, as you're describing to me more in detail what this book is to you, and, and kind of has been since its inception, it reminds me a lot of his work and what he does. And he definitely goes deep with his interviews and he literally goes in people's homes and kind of, it seems like he's living with Sounds them. like a guy I should meet. Yeah, no, definitely. I think he's out of New York or LA, but he does amazing work. And not only are the photos very high quality and, and they tell a story in themselves, but also the story writing is just incredible. And that's what I found in, in your book. And just now having you so eloquently describe it, I see there is kind of that, does that connection between what you're creating and he's more of a, a, a lifestyle writer and photographer where this is very much focused obviously in our industry in the food industry 
Um, but yeah, I'd be interested to see if you checked his workout, what you thought, if there was some synergies or some alignment there. But while, while you're describing to me this process and, and what this kind of gave birth to all this work over eight months, it does remind me, and you and I have talked about this off air before. It reminds me a lot of what I do in a way, shape or form. One thing that I've taken from this project, this podcast in the 13 months I've been doing it is I've learned an absolute ton. I've learned way more than I learned when I was a GM in London, England. I learned way more than I learned when I was bartending in Halifax. Like the stuff that I've learned with the people that I've sat across from and shared these conversations with is just invaluable. So what was that like for you? Were you consciously learning? Were you blown away by the stories you were being kind of let in to understand? Or were you unconscious about all this information that was just seeping into you from these amazingly gifted, caring, talented people? I was blown away, definitely. I mean, you know, when you're talking to 21 people over a couple of months, you know, that's 21 different personalities. Um, uh, even the married couple, you know, Makoto and Amanda were like yin and yang. They mm-hmm. were completely different people coming together to run this one restaurant, this one little cute gem in Kitsilano. But it is true, but it kind of, um, dude, it's a peek behind the veil. Right. Um, you know, we sensationalize and lionize these people in this industry. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, Instagram and this and that. We put bullshit filters on them and... and uh, Anyway, I mean, we'll talk about that maybe <laughs> maybe, maybe a bit later. Yeah. But I mean, this is this is still a very much like working class, almost blue collar world. Right. And uh, you know, like I'm interviewing somebody in the privacy of their own home, but when I get into the kitchen, you know, there's a dude peeling carrots on a milk crate, and that is the reality of this industry, and that's fine. Mm-hmm. It's actually pretty beautiful. Mm-hmm. Um, but but all this stuff that's going on in social media and you know, in that world isn't really representative of what's going on behind the kitchens. And, and that's why I didn't want to interview people, uh, you know, with like stage lighting in a studio or whatever. I wanted to, I wanted to go into their, into their living rooms and have an honest conversation. And that's how I do stuff for my magazine as well. Mm -hmm. I ask them hard questions and uh not not questions like to 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 go with the trends or to flow with all these things or whatever just just honest questions about their life and their hardship and and i like there there is a reason why i gravitated to this industry like my backgrounds in marketing and a little bit of finance i was a consultant before doing this and then i had a change of heart i moved to vancouver from montreal and i started doing film because mm-hmm. I was watch, watching Coen Brothers movies. And then, and then I found myself gravitating towards chefs and this and that. Obviously, there's something Freudian there that, you know, I'm looking for like a family, <laughs> right? I'm looking for like a sense of belonging. And right. I'm a diplomat's kid. So like every three years, we were like, we're, we're going, dude, say bye to your friends. Mm-hmm. So I was like, you know, obviously, there's a home there for me. But like chefs are no bullshit people. And, you know, in, in a place like Vancouver where people can get a little bit passive aggressive and, and not be that direct, um, I really, really appreciate that. You know, if you're doing business with a chef, if you're interviewing a chef, you ask him or her a question and they'll just tell you the answer. They don't like, you know, circumnavigate or circumvent right. the question. All and chefs? Most chefs, I would say. Yeah? Most chefs. I mean, at least the, the, the ones who have experience, the ones have, that, who have been doing it for, for, for an extended period of time. Why do you think that is? Why do you think they just get right to it? Um, I think it's because, because of their profession, because of their craft. Because mm-hmm. they, you know, I mean, uh, being a successful chef is about being punctual. <laughs> you, you know, it's, I mean, punctuality, right? Mm, and perf- it's like, performing, yeah. yeah, they don't have, they don't have time to waste. They're mm. just going to get to the bottom of it and answer your question. And they're going to be brutally honest with you. Mm. And, uh, you know, uh, to the point of being profane almost, which I really, really value, <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know, I mean, it's, uh, and, and that's why, and that's, I mean, it, 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 of course it, you know, it, it showed me another world. It's a peek behind the veil, all these stories that are so poignant. But, uh, you know, at, at the other end, it really reinforced some, some things for me about this industry that I had a little bit of doubts on, you know? Can we, uh, can we dig into that and dive into that? What, what did you have doubts on and what, again, talk about learning. What did you take away from this? Well, I mean, the one thing that people think is that th- these people can just, you know, bang out this stuff really quickly and easily, mm-hmm. um, you know, 
like uh, if something costs ten dollars on a menu, they're like, oh, ten dollars. This was eight dollars <laughs> somewhere else. But it's like there's so much work and sweat and, and tears that go into what these people are doing mm -hmm. that people don't realize because the kitchen's in a den or it's one floor <laughs> below or it's closed off. And and being a chef, I mean, being in this industry, it's it's really like a self-imposed insularity i mean they're insular by default mm -hmm. by disposition they have to be this way mm -hmm. and uh and you know most chefs i find <clears throat> sorry most chefs i find are you know are kind of closed off from the world and that can be a good thing or a bad thing in terms of getting a message across it can be a bad thing because they're just confined you know but in terms of in terms of like honing their craft and precision and banging things out you need you need a little bit of that insularity. Mm -hmm. You need a little bit of that closed offedness, you know, if I, if I can say, to, to, to perfect your craft. You know, you need a little bit of isolation. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's, and, you know, that's how artist minded people or artists work. You know, uh, painters don't, you know, painters need a studio. Right. where they can play Radiohead and I don't <laughs> get drunk, do drugs, and, and then paint. Right. Uh, I'm a writer, so I need an empty house with music and closed blinds and I need to just do my thing and it's insular like I was writing this book for eight months I didn't see any of my friends right I went for you know I try to walk at least five to ten k a day just as a daily exercise kind of thing and my mm. phone was telling me I was walking like 900 meters a day wow for eight months and uh but you need that you know, sometimes you need inspiration as well, like secondary inspiration, like go out for a walk. I don't know. Contemplate a lake, <laughs> <laughs> stuff like that. Right. Watch the birds. But thankfully, I have a dog. So the dog, <laughs> I have to walk my dog half an hour a day. Right. So those were like moments of reprieve. What what do you take inspiration from in all seriousness? If it isn't the lake, uh, the dog walks, what are you seeing in your community? What are you feeling? Is it is it music? Is it Radiohead? Is it? Uh, heavy narcotics. What do you? I mean, to music. Get inspired? But for me, for me personally, music is is not primary inspiration. It's something th that's ancillary. It's something that supports my process. Um, you know, I I do write with music on, and I do listen to a lot of Radiohead okay. because it puts me in this like melancholic mindset, and it kind of primes me. Um, but I always look for inspiration with the subject first. If I if I've interviewed a chef. I look for inspiration, not in what they said per se, but I look for inspiration in those moments where they welcomed me into their home, mm -hmm. maybe an object on a shelf in their living room, uh, maybe something they said to me that stuck. Like uh, Charlotte Langley is a chef in this book, and she's the only chef who doesn't reside in Vancouver who mm -hmm. got to be in this book because she works like hand in hand with Mark and Ash at Save On Meats, and, mm -hmm. and she comes to Vancouver very often. Astonishing chef. Um, she's also an ocean wise ambassador, I believe. Anyway, uh, she was here for a day and I had to get her interview because she, I think she was the last interview I conducted for this book. Oh wow. So she was the last write up as well. And I met her at seven o'clock on a Sunday in front of the gassy Jack statue. <laughs> and I, I'd never seen or ever been to Gastown that early. And it was like, Gastown was like so naked tumbleweeds so bare exactly yeah like you know just the you know like crows cackling like <laughs> that kind of shit yeah and and she arrived uh you know there's a there's a pretty literary impression that i wrote about this moment that mm -hmm. she arrived in this in this cap uh kind of like a horse carriage almost <laughs> like medieval england or something right so she arrives in this cab and there's nobody around and she comes out with a with like a like an industrial mayonnaise tub an empty mayonnaise tub of like utensils and, <laughs> and like, you know, wax paper. And I'm like, like, it what's was going on. Yeah. What's going on. So like in, in, in the, in our introduction, I described that moment because we were walking around, you know, taking pictures of her and like, she was walking around with this tub for like an hour around Vancouver and what's, she had like mince meat in it to make burgers and stuff. What's the story with the tub? It was just a vessel she found at the place she was staying. I guess she was staying with a friend. So it was just a vessel she found that morning to oh, like okay. bring all her equipment in. Because she doesn't live here, right? Right, right, right. So she just chugged a bunch of shit into a mayonnaise tub. 
uh, <laughs> and then did some shopping the night before, and then on we went to Save On Meats to, to cook her burger, which was fucking delicious. Amazing. Yeah, she's a great talent and, and young talent. I think there's people like her that are really going to shape and define our food scene here nationwide. Yeah, she cut her teeth here, so Vancouver's pretty dear to her heart, mm-hmm. you know? Mm-hmm. Is she from the east coast is she oh, yeah Montreal? yeah she east is coast? from the east coast yeah pei new brunswick pei i believe yeah 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 some great skill in pei actually yeah um that's that's a part of the world i feel like doesn't get a lot of most of us are part of the world but part of our country doesn't get a lot of hype and there's some good talent out there and some arguably some of the world's greatest free-flowing natural foods like look at look at the demand for something like lobster right now definitely yeah. like and that's just abundant in nova scotia yeah um there is this kind of like um built-in mm, like melancholia of people who live there do you oh, know yeah. what i mean yeah i talk about it with alex alex plowman's a very close friend of mine he's a chef in this mm-hmm. book and he's from you know out east and yeah you know there's always kind of like a there's a contemplation of like what's beyond you know, yeah, because yeah. he was a he was like a skater. He was a BMX guy. You know what I mean? That kind of like a misfit, yeah. you know, a- anarchy kind of attitude. And uh, <clears throat> and it was always like, you know, what lies there for me out out in the ocean? Right. You know, it's like I, I think it's kind of that like you know the New Jersey kid who wants to move to New York one day. <laughs> I, I feel that this attitude, uh, you know, is is pretty evident in in most people I've met from there personally yeah. yeah you're probably not wrong you know but they do a they do a good job of like repping their own town and stuff you know it's beautiful it's delightful yeah it's, it's, it's not easy to get around though i've heard you yeah know? no it's yeah they're definitely it's you're you're driving everywhere for sure yeah. not like here we can kind of you can walk exactly uh, you can just hike a mountain for like five hours and yeah exactly. you know and you can walk to your hike yeah you exactly. know even you know if you lived in north van you could totally do that it's true we are blessed here in vancouver super, very much super blessed and and spoiled with with our choices with restaurants in in this city let's talk about something you began to unpack and we kind of pumped the brakes on it a bit was the reality that we live in right now with things like social media and fast media and fast fashion and fast food and all of these fast things. And you used a term, uh, lionizing mm-hmm. of these chefs. Um, yeah. why, and I guess not why, how did we get here in your opinion? How did we get to this point where, uh, the Gordon Ramsays of the world have become this kind of rock star. Now they're on Fox TV and they've got 10 different channels or 10 different shows and 10 different concepts and restaurants in Vegas and in London and in Atlanta. How did food get to this spot? It all started with Marco Pierre Whiteman. <laughs> yeah, for sure. <laughs> the angry, you know, angry Marco. Yeah. The angry Marco, the rock star Marco. I, I don't know. I mean, I, uh, I think, I think it's not, it's not something specific to this industry, man. It's, it's happening everywhere. This proliferation, uh, this, uh, so to speak, this, you know, it's a positive word, but like the refinement of things, mm-hmm. you know, I, uh, like, uh, Marco, I was watching, uh, Marco Pierre White's, uh, Oxford talk the other day. And he said, we live, uh, in an era of refinement, no longer innovation. And I just feel like, you know, you can refine things in a good way, or you, or you can refine things in a bad way. Like I'm trying to do Instagram for my magazine and I have all these like, contrasty beautifully color corrected images and trying to write some like you know badass copy for these images and like i just i just can't grow it it's so saturated you know because there's a million digital platforms out there there's a million influencers out there and to be very honest with you this influencer thing like really pisses me off (laughs) i mean it's just you know at the end of the day it's just like it's just bullshit yeah um that that is my opinion um you know because uh, it's just numbers, man. It's a numbers game. Mm-hmm. It's a numbers game, and, and it's who got there first, the first mover advantage. And and it's also like our threshold is higher now, our threshold for attention. So it's like, you know, like a woman eating uh, like a whatever 20-pound lobster with her bare hands and stuff. Like, like why do we even watch this shit? <laughs> you know? Um, I'm also kind of like, I come from a culture where like food you respect food Mm -hmm. uh like you know on like tv shows and stuff where they're like throwing apple pies at each other and shit i hate that stuff oh it's brutal it's very it's very it's actually uh, disgusting it's it's disgusting it's uh sensationalizing something 
for the wrong purpose. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't know. I mean, how do like some of it is good and some of it is bad, man. You know, I uh, most most people I, I've interviewed, for instance, in this book, they don't even have a TV. Yeah. They don't they probably have they don't have time to watch TV. Yeah. Most of the things I, I do learn nowadays, I'll be frank, are from TV. And there's a, a lot of good stuff out there, um, you know, like all these Netflix shows and whatever. Like you can find some really, really educational stuff out there. Mm -hmm. um, but a lot of stuff is bad. A lot of stuff is just horseshit. And uh, I, I think it's 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 really up to us. To be like, you know, um, am I giving this person a like? Am I watching their show? Am I giving them ratings? Mm -hmm. Am I frequenting their page? So it's up to me. You know, it's up to you. It's up right. to everybody. It's so a choice. It's, it's, all, a, it's, it's a, all choice. It's a choice. But the thing is like, you know, late at night, long day at work, kids screaming in the other room. Yeah, you want to watch a lady eat a lobster, <laughs> you know, with her bare hands. It's funny. Yeah. Just like dog and cat videos. They're amazing. Yeah. You know, what's funny is um, we, we actually don't have a TV and we haven't had a TV now as, as a family for three and a half, almost four years. And we were just actually back. I don't know if you know this. I'm from, I'm from Halifax. So Halifax is my hometown. So we just were back in Nova Scotia visiting and staying at my parents' place. And they have TVs, multiple and I was actually really excited because I'm a I'm a big Seinfeld fan. I if I can fall asleep watching sports, I'm in heaven. Uh, but I found myself watching TV, and I put it on what I guess is I don't know what the channel was called, but it had a food program on it, and I actually couldn't watch it. It was painful. It was so fake and so scripted that I just, I had, I was so disappointed because I wanted to get into something and just like, turn off my brain a bit. But it was just so fake. There was nothing real you're, about it. You're so right, man. I started watching a lot of television in, in university when I was living in Montreal. Mm -hmm. And I remember buying my first plasma television and it was like, oh my God, this television is huge. You're watching like a football game or a soccer game and be like, I can see these, <laughs> like I can see the follicles in their hair. <laughs> it's amazing, this HD thing, you yeah. know, back in the day. And uh, I, like I, you know, I watched Food Network every day. And back then, it wasn't like dinners, drive-ins, and dives. It no. was like educational TV. Yeah, it's like, like here's how you make. Yeah, this. like Bourdain. Bourdain had a show on there, cooking salmon and whatever. Later, you know, he kind of like bashed Food Network, and he doesn't. You know, he never liked Mario Batali or uh, Bobby Flair or whatever. Right. Um, neither did I. But uh, <laughs> it, it was educational. Like you could learn things. And you know, mm -hmm. as a, as a college kid, I mean, I already had a foundation. I'd been cooking a long time. My mother is an astonishing cook. And uh, she taught me young, but, um, you know, you could learn these things and go to the market and whatever, you know, I didn't have a lot of money back then, but you could go get some chicken strips and saute it and make something. And, right. and now, uh, sometimes I like stumble upon that channel and it's just like bullshit after bullshit after bullshit. Like it's morphed into something that is just not recognizable to me any longer. Yeah. Um, you know, it's like. Carnival eats the biggest burger, the, you know, uh, double deep fried churros. Like, <laughs> let's not do this. Yeah, it's upsetting. Um, I actually took part in um, a local shoot here a few months ago. I guess almost a year ago now for the Food Network. And I won't name the show, uh, but if you see me on the Food Network, you'll know the one. Um, and I was... I think I can take a guess. <laughs> <laughs> and I was really upset. I was not upset. I wasn't like whining, but I was just... Because this is what I do. I do this podcast and this book is what you do and the, the magazine is what you do. And, and we'll get into this because I really want to pick your brain on this in a second. But this is real. This is you and I right now sitting down. Mm -hmm. There just happens to be a GoPro right there that's mm -hmm. got a red light flashing. This has a red light on it. We're just conversing. This will then go up onto the internet for anyone to consume it, whoever wants to. There's nothing. I didn't tell you anything about this podcast. I didn't script anything about this podcast and i'm not saying this is the way to do it but this is the kind of media that i want to consume i want to cons i want to really know your story i want to really know about this book and i want to ask questions that are sincere so i can do a true deep dive and find out more for myself selfishly but then also the listeners as well and on set of this food network show it just proved to me how fake this all is and the amount of people that are doubling down on this stuff as the real information 
of this is what restaurants are like and this is what food is like. It is not at all. Like if 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 I could count on my hands how many times they asked someone to say that again, but this instead, or take a bite like this, or I'm going to ask you this, can you say this? There's just nothing real about it. I think that's my concern with the industry but then i see books like this and i meet farmers like i meet and i meet restaurateurs like i meet and chefs like i meet and i think you know what there's still hope for us because we have little sparks like this book that eventually will ignite i hope another movement and that movement will be a true understanding and a true dialogue of what this industry actually needs and what it actually is and what it is is people literally bleeding every single day to, so that you and I can go and enjoy some oysters on a patio somewhere. Yeah, absolutely. There's much more to it than say this when I ask you this. It's just fake. It's not real. But we need we need more people, if I can fly your flag for a minute, we need more people like you doing what you do. And my hope is that you don't stop. We need a little bit of anarchy is what you're saying. We do need some anarchy. We do need some, what you and I talked about before. We, we, we grabbed coffee. About it. Yeah, yeah. We do need some yeah. anarchy. We, need, we need something that shakes it up a little Definitely, bit. Definitely. Um, so I'm open to hear more of your thoughts on on that and what that anarchy may may need to look like or have to look like. Well, I don't know, man. I mean, I'm, listen, I'm not, um, I'm not very versed in the industry and whatever. I interview people. I, I published a book, um, you know, I felt like this industry kind of beckoned me in a way, and I'm here. Um, uh, you know, I don't, I don't know enough about the industry to like, you know, get into platitudes and deductions or whatever. Mm -hmm. But I'm a sentient human being, and I'll, you know, I, I speak my heart, right? And the fact that is like, I, I feel in the last couple of years or so, um, especially in Vancouver, it's been a little stagnant in terms of things that are exciting me, and of course. It's expensive to live here. Uh, it's the restaurant business is a hard business. I was interviewing Robbie Kane of Medina and Superbaba, and he and I said, "What kind of traits does it take for somebody to be successful in this industry?" And he said, "Lunacy," <laughs> and he was very serious. Yeah, uh, and you know, and just a bunch of benign lunatics, nice lunatics running this town. Mm -hmm. But I need more lunacy. Totally. And uh, when I say anarchy, I don't mean like, fuck this, fuck that. I don't mean that. Yeah, I no. mean anarchy in the sense that, um, like, just, I don't really plug institutions. It's not my style, but like maybe Shambar, right? That was anarchic. Back in the day, uh, in, a, in a, it's called Crosstown, Crosstown now. They coined the term, actually. Okay. On Beatty Street when there was tumbleweeds and yeah. like a Hell's Angels ticket office and a church pew. Mm -hmm. And like there was nothing in that neighborhood and people were afraid to park their cars there. Out come this young couple, you know, Belgian Canadian couple. And they're like, fuck this. We're doing it. We're doing it. Mm -hmm. We're going to lose money. If we do, if it all goes bust, we'll <laughs> yeah. move to Mexico. Yeah. And they did it. And they did it in a way where they were like, you know, fine dining. Like it's, it's still fine dining, but mm -hmm. it's casual, right? Mm -hmm. They're like white tablecloths. No. Uh, it's going to be refined food, good food, but it's going to be like, you know, your mom's living room. That's going to be the vibe. That's going to be our brand of hospitality. And they did it. Mm -hmm. They did it. And what happened? They like, of course, now they're mainstream <laughs> because that's what happens, right? Independent yep. filmmaker makes an art movie. People love it. Producers come out. Hot stars come out. Actors, actresses, they become mainstream. Blockbuster, Ra Radiohead, musicians, Radiohead. artists. Ra I mean, Radiohead is a, is a touchy subject <laughs> for me because I, I love Radiohead. And, and I feel that they, they, they've still, like, they're, they're very much uh, sheltered in that way where they don't let any, like, commercial interests warp them. Right. And they're probably one of the very few bands on earth that have had that luxury mm. and uh, because everybody was expecting a rock album and then they come up with Kid A and it's like, whoa, what's going on here? Right. Anyway, uh, different conversation, I guess. <laughs> but, but anyway, that's what I mean by anarchy. I mean, you know, they, they did this, like Brad, they did this in such a respectable manner. 
Mm. They did it in such, like when I say anarchy, I don't mean like fuck everybody else. We're going to do it. Blah, blah, blah. Yeah. It's not garbage in the streets. Exactly. Like they did it in a way that respected hospitality, that respected their colleagues and their peers. And now if you look at it, uh, you know, most of the most successful, the hottest restaurants, institutions, or the industry people in this town Mm -hmm. are from there. Yeah. Or ha- have cut their teeth there or have come through there. And I think that's a very, um, uh, you know, I think it's some, some, what of a legacy in this town, uh, you know, that institution. And rightfully so. And rightfully so. So that's what I mean. I just mean, um, you know, if you, if you think something's not going to work, if you think something's not going to sell, put it on the menu anyway. Mm-hmm. Say fuck it. Yeah. And, you know, if an influencer comes and gives it like a one star review, who gives a shit? Keep doing it. Yeah. Keep doing it. Because if you believe in something and your stuff is sound, there is no way you won't succeed. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? If you really believe in it. And and the the one thing that all chefs have is persistence. Because if you don't have persistence, you don't get to where you are. True. You know, that's one trait that all chefs possess. Good chefs or cooks. Yeah. You know, is that persistence. Because persistence, repetition... These are like in their DNA, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I actually just, I just before I came down here, finished penning, if you will, a blog. And it was about the two types of successful restaurants worldwide. And one of the types are the ones that are willing to stand alone. And they're the ones like the Shambars who are willing to go down that street where there is literally nothing and just say, this is where we're doing it. Danny Meyer did it in New York with his restaurants. Yeah, Danny Meyer's huge. Um, and there have been many, many other people that have just said, you know what, we're going to do it. We'll be the first. Let us be the bushwhackers. That's what we need more of. But I feel like in this city and guests of this show that are extremely talented, they have been governed a bit by things like social media, by things like reviews, that they're just doing burgers when they should be doing more. Yeah, I think we have enough burgers in this town, man. Right. You know. But you know what I think? They're, they're just, there's that fear because, like you said, this is an expensive city and people are fighting over bums and seats. So are they willing to, sorry, what hill are they willing to die on? Is the safer bet to do Nashville fried chicken on the menu and then just do that? Or is it, is it you know what, fuck the chicken, do what you really want to do really push it because that is in a whole other topic. That's what's going to move us forward as a, as an industry, not only in the city, but in this country. I, you know, like there's a lot of chefs that I, I also uh, I've chance to meet and I know from the grapevine and, and, and they're not willing to fight those battles, man. That's, I mean, end of story. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, uh, I think for most chefs, uh, you know, they have families, they have kids, they have mouths to feed. And at the end of the day, they're like, like, if you if you have a successful business, if you're selling a lot of Nashville fried chicken and there's like lines out the door, mm-hmm. you know, and that place in question I was in front of the other day and there was literally like like a hundred people in line. I've yeah. never seen anything like. We can show. I, I'm a fan. I'm a fan. Of Doug and I'm a fan too. Yeah. So yeah. DL DL yeah. chicken here in Vancouver. They're yeah. just they're literally crushing it. Yeah, and you know Doug had another restaurant, a beautiful restaurant yeah. where you could buy like pasta. Yeah. beautiful pasta and oysters and whatever and uh, and he decided to do that and 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 in the in in terms of you know in context of the industry he is very successful oh god yeah he is very successful you know i was like you know coming from more of a consumer standpoint i was like how could he let this place go and open a fried chicken place how how dare he but you're different uh, yeah but you know um people want their fried chicken man and he makes, you know, he makes an amazing chicken. I haven't tasted it. You know, I'm like 99% vegetarian. <laughs> so I don't do that. But uh, if people like it and it's successful and he's opening more of it, that is a successful entrepreneur. Yeah. That is a successful entrepreneur. You know, in terms of just like thinking about food and, and, and you know, that like rock star chef who like, you know, is an artist or whatever. That's another, that's a, that's another conversation. Mm-hmm. Do you know what I mean? Like that's, yeah. that's just, I just wonder what we can do and what we can do here in our city, but also across this country and bring people together to maybe take some more calculated risk. I don't know what that would look like, but at the end of the day, things like Netflix have done wonders. Things like YouTube have done wonders for food. Food is so hot right now. Food Definitely. is so sexy. Like people, yeah. people that don't cook 
are spending hours watching food shows and now they want to cook or now they want to go to Michelin star restaurants. It wasn't on their radar at or all. Or buy all these appliances. Or buy all these appliances. You know what I mean? Yeah. They're now emulsifying things and sous vide things and doing all this stuff yeah. that they never, they didn't even have a frying pan before. Yeah. So I think that actually is great. But then I, then I challenge us as an industry is what can we do to capitalize on that and then begin to, like your book, further educate people on this is what actually goes, this is a story beyond just what's on the plate and help them understand. I mean, something as simple as, let's take, for example, spot prawns. It comes up on the show quite often with chefs. Some chefs that I've interviewed won't serve spot prawns on their menus because they can't afford to serve spot prawns because you and I aren't willing to spend what they would need to charge for it to be a viable product. Mm. I just interviewed a chef in Halifax. He puts it on his menu every year. It's three weeks a year that they're in season out here. He gets them shipped out. He loses money every single time someone orders it, but he does it because that's what the people want. So I guess my question is, how do we, one, educate the public on this is what it actually costs to produce this gorgeous food that you're consuming? And then how do we bring people being chefs in this city and, and restaurateurs to to kind of create this organic movement where we take calculated risk and allow for those that have been dying to flex their muscles to flex their muscles and support them and lift them up and tell the public like guys this is what you should be eating this is the food you should be trying what is that path like how do we do that i mean that's not a question for me to answer man you can uh, pontificate though i can pontificate definitely but that is the, ultimately it's up to the chef and it's up to the farmers and the you know the the people procuring these things but uh uh in terms of pontification i'll just tell you um i don't know i mean i'm i'm kind of lost on it i think i was listening to your to, to the podcast with jefferson yeah. your podcast with mm -hmm. jefferson and he said that you know there isn't a big picture here like there isn't something meta that we're working towards mm -hmm. like most cities do uh, and uh, obviously, I mean, I sensed some resentment in the things he was telling you. I sensed that he was upset. And that is so human and so beautiful because mm -hmm. I don't see fucking enough of it. It's real. I really don't. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, he was saying that he was upset, that he, you know, uh, tried to recourse to, you know, whatever BC tourism or whatever, and they just shot him down. Mm -hmm. and, and the people he was speaking of was like Massimo Bottura and all yeah. these people that he wanted to bring here that he was friends with previously. Yeah, the, like Fernand Andrea. Like exactly. Amazing, amazing, celebrated yeah, people. And by the way, I do have a story in the same vein. Like I, I tried to do international food events here and fly out some Turkish you mentioned that, yeah. some Turkish yeah. chefs here. Yeah. And I had contacted um, Dine Out because they had these like special dinners uh, that were kind of like in the international category where they like produce these special events and whatever. And, and mm -hmm. I was like, I'll do it for free, man. Like, I just want to, you know, grow you know, this. Like, like, you know, culture, yeah. exchange yeah. of culture. And I, and I also wanted to do a second leg in Istanbul. So oh, I cool. wanted to bring like wh whomever hosted these Turkish chefs here. I mm -hmm. wanted to bring them to Istanbul. Like a home at home. Exactly. Yeah. A hundred percent. Yeah. And, and it was like, oh, we have sponsors, we have guidelines, blah, blah, blah. And I just, I was just like, I didn't even fucking respond because right. I'm not going to waste my time. Yeah. I'm just going to go somewhere else and make it happen. Right. And uh, we do need a meta conversation here, man. Uh, you know, uh, th like it's, it's a beautiful place to live. Mm -hmm. It's a beautiful place to eat. Uh, we just need to come together on, on a higher plane to have an, to have some discourse, to have some open discussion about where we are going. But, you know, it, unfortunately rent is expensive. Leases are shitty. Uh, places are falling apart and people are just like, man, like I just need to get it out on a plate and blah, blah, blah. And like, you have to understand, um, I, I've been reading, just for inspiration, George Orwell's uh, Down and Out in Paris and London. Have you read that book? No. You definitely should. Yeah. It's amazing. Okay. It is the primary piece of literature that gives you insight into into kitchens in Paris. Oh, wow. Amazing. And the Escoffier's world. Because George Orwell, I don't know whether it's out of social experiment or just because he was, you know, poor at the time. He was right. like, you know, very poor. And he worked as a dishwasher. Oh, I had no idea. A, in a Paris hotel for, for an extended amount of time. And he just describes it and he says, like, you know, we used to serve a chicken, like a rotisserie chicken. And this is like 1920s, eh? This is like before the Second World War. Thank you, sir. 
And like we dropped a chicken on the floor and this is like an opulent, <laughs> elegant hotel, right? right where right, we're, right. you know, where Americans and British people are staying in Paris. And he's like, we just put it, you know, we wiped it with a, <laughs> with a cloth, put it in the lift and sent it up. So, so what I'm trying to say back to my point is it, it's not a chef's priority or reality, like, you know, to, to, to talk about these things. It's not their, it's not their immediate concern. Mm -hmm. their immediate concern is getting something out to feed a customer and to think about the people they employ and to wake up tomorrow morning and do the same thing all over again and to pay their rent. And, and in, in, in this context, in this reality, uh, it's very difficult and it's almost unrealistic to think that they're going to come out of there, have a day off and be like, okay, guys, where are we steering this ship? <laughs> So it's, it's, it's up to you and me maybe to say, Hey, like, can we have a conversation? Would you come over for a coffee? Can mm -hmm. we talk about it? Mm -hmm. And then if they reciprocate, fine. But if they don't, you know, there has to be, uh, and I know of your intentions, like you do these beautiful dinners and, uh, and I'm all in, if you're in, if you want to, you know, get together and talk about doing something meta like almost with an academic dimension mm -hmm. to talk about spot prawns and the sustainability of oysters and, right. and just from the land kind of talk, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And just distinguish this province and this city from, from anything else in Canada, anything else in the world, anything else in the world. And, you know, sometimes it comes up like we do have like chop the tallest poppy kind of syndrome in this country. Mm -hmm. They have it a lot in, you know, Scandinavian countries as well. We have, I think a, a, a more mild version of it. But why not? You know, why yeah. can't Vancouver be the tallest poppy? Why can't we? Yeah. Why can't we just be like this city's the fucking best? I don't give a shit what <laughs> you're doing in Toronto. Yeah. I really don't. Yeah. You know. Yeah. And, you know. Let's let's get like let's get local meta mm -hmm. first, and then we can you know rep other cities and be like Canada, yay! Right, right. You right. know. But let's let's be like Vancouver's the best. Yeah. You better know it. Yeah, I feel like at times we're too Canadian. We're we're a little too passive. Yeah. And yeah. we're too like, no, no, it's okay. It's okay. I'm just like, no, man, like we've got a ton of talent. And something that uh, Jefferson, Jefferson, part of me shared on the podcast was he feels like our terroir actually offers far more than some, something like a Scandinavia offers, like, like what they have in Copenhagen to go, oh, I'm and, sure. go and forage. Like I'm he's sure. like, he's like, I could take you in the woods and show you things that would blow your mind that just naturally occur from our soil. And I've met farmers and I've been so blessed that that's a, I think it, there's a whole other book there when it comes to the people that are farming our food in this province, in this country, and just how passionate they are and how excited they are about what this earth is just providing us. It's amazing. Just We're in East Van right now, for those of you that don't know, so East Vancouver, and I have taken my daughter on our bike up and down the alleys, and the amount of natural growing fruit that exists here just blows me away. Plums, you name the color, it exists. Figs you could literally choke an elephant with how many figs are just growing here naturally. Blackberries, raspberries, blueberries, all of this stuff. It's yeah, literally all just around. everywhere. Yeah. Everywhere. The potential that we have with the talent and then the product is just like, it's, it, it should be setting us up for the most epic yeah. performance. Those of all are time. the real anarchists, by the way, man, the farmers. Oh, really dude. Are. Oh, man. I, I Farmers said this, are crazy. I've said this now, probably, pardon the pun, half a dozen times on this show that this book will be a, a farming book two, five years from now. Netflix will be farmers on that. They are the true rock stars. It already is to an extent, man. It's, you don't have a TV, let me tell you. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. But it should be like what these people are doing. And, and let, I mean, again, this is a whole other kite we could put a long tail on there's a lot of issues we have because of things like there are no young agrarians. There's not enough young farmers. So who's going to farm our food 20? What's my daughter going to eat 20 years from now? What is her, her food going to look like? But the people that are doing it now are, are so passionate. And I've learned so much about Canadian food, whether it be dairy or poultry or just our produce that these people care more than you have any idea. And the fact that they get to have their food featured at, Ubuntu up the street at David's restaurant, they're like over the moon. And that to me is just so, it's so real and so sincere and so vulnerable. And it doesn't get more, what's the word? It just doesn't get more real than literally growing something from a seed and then giving it to your community. 
That yeah. to me is such a beautiful thing. Yeah. And you know, when I talk to chefs and they, they talk to me about farmers coming in and having a conversation about tomatoes in season or whatever, yeah. most chefs are like most chefs who have worked in other cities or apprenticed in other cities, they are blown away by, by the local independent farms in this city specifically. Yeah. They're like, I've never seen such clean produce that washed so beautifully delivered, so pristine. And, and it's true. And I think that is, that is one thing going for the city, man. I'm telling you the farmers mm -hmm. really, I mean, uh, <coughs> you know, all these farmers, I don't want to like single out anybody cause they're all doing a beautiful job. Mm -hmm. But I think one way to start for, for people like you and I, for the common folk, let's say is to sign up for CSA programs with farms, right? <coughs> you know, instead of me. going to save on or whatever, uh, you know, some supermarket that has shit from like Peru, yeah. you know, get, sign up for a CSA yeah. program. And many people don't know that these things exist yeah. and you get a box every week or every month or whatever for, you know, for like a good amount. Yeah. And then, and then, and then it empowers you to cook those things and to learn about that stuff as well. Like, Oh, I've never cooked with a whatever, uh, zucchini blossoms before, right. you know, yeah. uh, let me try that. And yeah. it's something new every month. It's in season. And it's a good way to support your community. And it's a good way to empower yourself as a cook. Totally. And if we, if we don't do things like that, like I said, the, the grim reality is those farms won't exist. Yeah. Um, something that I'm working on with a gentleman by the name of Brad from Biota Fermentation. I don't know if you know Brad Hendrickson. No, I don't. Uh, so him and I are putting on a dinner. I'd love to get you involved as well um, in September uh, because... I won't name names right now, but there's a local farmer, individual, small little Asian lady, and almost everything burnt down. And, oh, wow. And her produce is revered in the city, mm -hmm. and people love her. So we are bringing, I would argue, some of the most talented chefs in the city together to charge way too much for a ticket and have eight courses, blow people out of the water, but give all of the proceeds to this woman because she deserves it. Because wow. if it wasn't, if wasn't for her you and I dining at X restaurant on a Friday night, we wouldn't be able to enjoy that food as much um, because of what she does. I think this industry, and I say this industry, I mean farming and cooking and restaurants is such a thankless space. Um, the amount of stories I've heard of chefs out in the field by themselves crying because they just lost $5,000 of kale due to inclement weather or ducks that came in or something. Like this is the reality they deal with. Yeah, of course. Do you know what I mean? Like it's yeah. it's 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 that it's that dynamic and that uh, very varying where I, I keep saying you and I, but the general public generally has no idea that mm. this is happening behind the scenes. Like you're saying with these stories, like there's so much to what goes into the food that we eat in restaurants, in grocery stores, whatever it may be. So I just I just want people to educate themselves and. I think you made a great point. A CSA is such a fantastic way to start and your dollars go directly into your community. Exactly. And of course, farmer's markets and this and that. Farmer's markets are quite expensive. I mean, compared to what you get at a supermarket, you know right. what I mean? Right. But, but it's worth it. Yeah. It's, it's worth it because some of the stuff is obscure. Like I cook a lot. I cook every day. Mm -hmm. I've been cooking a long time. And I just love going and finding these new things, whether they're edible flowers to like garnish my salad with or something else. Right. But like you see the difference, man. Like you see like just, just the carrots whispering something to you <laughs> that the carrot at whatever yeah. a supermarket isn't. Yeah. You know what I mean? And it's just like, I just love seeing like, you know, their dirty fingernails and stuff and setting up shop. And yeah. like, it's, it's just beautiful. It's as raw as it's it gets. It's beautiful. You know, there's a dude, like a hippie dude with like <laughs> a long beard selling uh, sea asparagus and, and you yeah. know, um, and it's just like, I love talking to that guy and totally, man. you know, he has these little like sachets, these brown bags that he sells everything in. And he's like, these are three, these are five. It's like he's selling weed or something, <laughs> but it's, it's really, yeah. you know, it's just like, I love going and talking to those guys oh, man, I and they're it. so happy, man. All of them are so fucking happy. Dude, like, so happy. Yeah. Like if I, if I'm having a shitty morning, which is every morning, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's like you go to these people and like you have a coffee, you walk around, you take the dog, you see children playing singing farmers markets like that is something so beautiful about this city oh, that dear. i don't care whatever toronto montreal like the farmers markets that community in this city yeah it's banging amazing yeah it's banging actually our next dinner uh is shameless plug which will be a few days after this airs is um we're raising uh money for the vancouver farmers market nutrition 
uh, coupon program, which is they got to like truncate that name. Man. I know, dude. They it's got to market it's it better. Long, it's a long one. Uh, but Find the, an acronym. Yeah, the idea is you and I have a few dollars to spare, so we give it to this program, and this program then uh, gives these coupons to. Uh, predominantly the elderly population, but a lot of single mothers as well. Nice. And that allows for them to go and shop and engage at the farmer's market and act like you and I and go buy those organic peaches they probably could never buy or those heirloom tomatoes, which are just off the chains. So it allows for them to kind of play in that world a bit and feel a little bit more normal. It invites them into that world, which <laughs> exactly. is great. Exactly. Yeah. So I'm, I'm super, super proud to be supporting that platform. And if you guys are listening, um, please do engage with the farmer's market and that nutrition coupon program because it helps a lot of the families and individuals in this city access uh, really nutrient-dense, healthy, delicious food that they otherwise wouldn't be able to access. So again, I'm super proud that we're doing that uh, this month. Um, let's change speeds just a, a little bit. Let's go back to the book. Yep. If you could, and this may be a tough question, but if you could help me and listeners understand who is this book for, and then how do you see that person then interacting with it? Obviously, with the stories come recipes, come beautiful photos as well. So in your mind's eye, when you're creating this over the, over the eight months, when it becomes a thing, are you envisioning like what is your avatar? Who is your person? Is this book for everyone or is it for a specific person uh, whether it be in the city, in this province, in this country, or worldwide? I mean, the good thing, it's a its a tough question, but an honest answer, man. And I'll tell you, like, the, the good thing about doing, like, a portfolio piece, like, this is my work, it's my literature, and it is literature. It's food literature. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, when, when a writer is, you know, uh, creating literature, he or she, they don't think readily about who's going to be reading this. Right. Um, my honest answer is I couldn't care less. Uh, but of course, and because the thing is when you're, when you're making a book like this, of course you want it to sell more. Of mm. course you want people to like it, to receive it better. But these, we, we never made, you know, these marketing or demographic, whatever considerations, it wasn't a part of the plan. Right. Um, it was, we're going to do a book with a very, very, very limited budget and we're going to put it out in the world and see what happens. That was really you know, honestly, mm. our intention. Mm -hmm. um, but of course, I mean, anybody, anybody who has a penchant for any kind of literature, uh, for reading especially, if you like reading stuff, mm -hmm. um, most cookbooks, you'd probably find the same. Like you buy, I, I, I'm a culprit in this as well. I don't buy cookbooks for recipes, man. I buy it to look at the pictures. Oh, yeah, they're sexy as hell. You huh? know, I just bought the Joe Beef cookbook, the Apocalypse yep. Now. I bought the Matthew Matheson one. And I'm just looking at the pictures like I'm not going to cook a, <laughs> a, you know, a lobster thermidor or whatever from the Joby. It's not going to yeah. fucking happen. Yeah. Uh, but I just love looking at the pictures and I love reading the stories. And the thing is, cookbooks are becoming magazines mm -hmm. and vice versa. Right. And magazines are also becoming cookbooks. Uh, you know, because every magazine, lifestyle magazine you pick up, it's like food recipes, food this, food that. Something's com somebody's coming out with a cookbook, whatever. Mm -hmm. And uh, vice versa. So... Um, I, you know, I've gotten a lot of beautiful, beautiful feedback from people who have read these stories and um, some to the point of being moved to tears mm -hmm. and uh, the chefs themselves included, of course. And um, yeah, I mean, the, the, just the ethos, the vision, the, what this book is trying to do is really it's it's a peek behind the veil is to share. It's to go a little bit deeper with food and with story, you know. Because if you're like, oh, what am I going to cook tonight? Let me just look up a recipe. <laughs> it's, this is not your book, dude. Right. It's not your book. Right. I mean, of course, still buy it, please. Yes. Because 100% <laughs> of the profits feed people literally on the street level. And mm -hmm. that's very important. So if you're going to make a donation anyway, you get a beautiful book. You don't have to open it. I don't care right. if you read it or not. Please do, but right. I don't care. Right. And if you want to buy the book for the book, just for the sake of buying a beautiful book, then you know, you're also you know, making a beautiful donation. And, and, uh, I think it's about time, man. So many, so many of these recipes of these stories about mindful eating, mm -hmm. about time, you know, about sit down and just read a story for like 10 minutes and then contemplate the recipe and, and, and cook it beautifully and share it with people. Mm -hmm. That's all, that's all we're trying to do here. You know, there is no fine prints, other, any other subtext. Yeah, it's so well written, and the photos are amazing. The, the stories are just fantastic. I actually was really surprised with 
I don't want to say surprise me, it's a bad word, but I was, for lack of a better term, I was surprised with your writing and how, and how you chose to kind of tell the stories. I was really blown away. It is much more than I expected. I thoroughly enjoyed it. And I think anyone who is listening, if you are into understanding more of what goes into food, whether you know these chefs that are featured or not, this will just give you uh, kind of a peek under the tent. Uh, of what really goes into and the stories are just amazing and um, yeah I applaud you for what you did and thank you I will fly that flag as much as I possibly can Uh, let's just stay on it for one more moment Uh, if people do want to engage with the book they do want to pick it up how best they do that Uh, the best way would be online so the publisher's webpage is foodforall.ca if they go there I believe the book is $45 and if you just want to go in, have a meal, and get, get your own private copy, you can go to Save On Meats. They oh, have perfect. tons there. Perfect. You can just you know pay them a visit, uh, buy a book, have a burger. Um, they're also available at Gourmet Cook Warehouse. Nice. Or Gourmet Warehouse. Gourmet Warehouse, yeah. And at Harvest Union Market. Oh, I love Harvest Union. Yeah, they, they also stock it. And uh, a bunch of places in Comox Valley and Tofino that I'm not privy to. Oh, okay. But, um, yeah, I mean, it's, you know... Uh, we're, I guess the, the publisher is trying to do, you know, their utmost in kind of disseminating this and getting copies out there into the world. And that's awesome. And of course it's word of mouth. So if you like the book, tell a friend. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, I don't know if you're o- aware, Hawk, on the, the, this podcast, I'm sure you're aware this piece is called the half a dozen hospitality podcast. Yes. And every podcast I ask my guest the exact same questions, mm-hmm. two of them. This is the only part of the podcast that I try and repeat. So I have for you those two questions. It's a motif, a light motif. There you go. Thank you. Thank you. I have for you two questions. If you're open to it, Uh, it's going to cause a bit of improv for you, but I'm sure you can handle it. uh, And I'm sure you'll answer them very eloquently. Uh, The first is the half a dozen have twos. So I need from you one to six items, one to half a dozen items of things you've experienced in your life Mm -hmm. that you feel like our listeners or myself have to experience so you mentioned george orwell's book which i'll definitely pick up and get into thank you for that but it's something else whether it is a, another radiohead album or a piece of art you've looked at or a book you've read or a camera you use or a city you visited one to six of your have twos um i think one thing would be just volunteer for something um in some way, in some form or another, try to do something for your community and expect nothing in return. Mm-hmm. I think that would be one of my have tos because it's so um, like doing this book. It's it was it was I mean, of course, it's a step up for my career because I just I mean, technically, I'm a cookbook author, whatever right. that means. Yeah, it's awesome. Uh, it's beautiful. But I think that would be one um, have to say. Eh? Mm-hmm. Uh, that was a good one. That was strong. You, you came out. You came out swinging with that one. Um, I think number two would be set aside more time for literature. Okay. Uh, by literature, I mean pretty much any of the arts, really. Mm-hmm. Uh, read more. Uh, you know, reading really expands minds, man. Oh, dude, that's uh, crazy. You know, especially, so- especially, I'm talking to the younger generation and to the millennials. You mm-hmm. know, technically, I'm a millennial. Right. An older millennial. <laughs> but um, read more. That would be one. Uh, two, um, if you're into, you know, the gastronomy and this and that, definitely visit Paris. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, definitely. I was born there and uh, we didn't spend a lot of time there because, you know, my parents are like, it's, we have a child now and it's, the city is quite expensive. <laughs> so we should ask to be restationed somewhere. Right. And then we moved to Bulgaria. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, a little bit different. A little bit different. <laughs> <laughs> at I mean, in terms of gastronomy, quite different, yeah. I would say. Yeah. Um, but definitely visit Paris. Um, it's just the, the level of refinement mm-hmm. uh, is just. I mean, I you know I'm about humble food now. I'm about food that I enjoy eating, whatever. But just it's nice to see the level of refinement with everything. Mm-hmm. Like I, I I'm also a photographer. I take a lot of pictures, and in Paris, I I, I revisited Paris after my birth after like 25 years a okay, while wow. ago and um i was i was at the Cannes film festival with a movie of mine so we went to paris and i just put down my camera after the second day 
because yeah. I was like, dude, like everything's so pretty, so we'll find <laughs> enough. Yeah. You know, I don't want to take another picture of a beautiful building, you know. Yeah. So that would be three. Uh, and New York as well, I'll add. Yeah. New crazy, York is crazy city. From one of my favorite cities on earth. Mm-hmm. And it's just an experience. Uh, I think those would be my half twos, man. I like it, man. Those are really good. Paris, yeah, Paris is very, very special. If you haven't been and you have the ability to, definitely check it out. And if you have the ability, come across where you should look it up and put it on your list of to-dos is uh, Cocotte de Jolie, which is on the south side of the river. I found it not knowing I was going to find it and ended up being one of the most amazing dining experiences I've ever had. Uh, They didn't speak English. I speak really poor French, mm. but it was one of the most memorable meals I've ever had. And just a tiny, tiny restaurant, a husband and wife team, and talk about refinement, but approachable at the same time. Yeah. Which I loved. Uh, so, yeah, shout out to Coco Choli. It's beautiful. Uh, okay. Last question I have for you then, sir, is the half a dozen haven't yet. So, same kind of idea one to six, one to half a dozen of things that you've yet to experience in your life. You've seemingly have done quite a bit, traveled around, lived a lot of places, eaten a lot of food, seen a lot of things, listened to a lot of Radiohead. But what are some things that you have yet to experience well, I mean, that you the, want to? I haven't seen Radiohead live. Oh my gosh, really? Yeah. I, have you? That I haven't. Yeah. I haven't, but I feel like you're, um, I'm a big Radiohead guy, but I feel like you're a little bit bigger than I am. Uh, maybe, I don't know. I mean, I just... Uh, Tom York has a new solo album out called uh, Anima. And, he's uh, touring. Is he coming to Toronto? He's, he's coming to Vancouver in October. <sighs> and the tickets sold out in like three seconds. So hopefully I'm going to, you know... Uh, Craigslist it? Craigslist it or whatever. Go to the door and... Sell a body part. Pay some, you know, <laughs> pay some shoddy guy to like, yeah. <laughs> you know, like $800 for one ticket or something. Yeah, exactly. I don't know, but I, I definitely want to go. Um, it's, yeah, man, I don't know how it worked out. Um, I've just never been in the, uh, the know, right place, right, the right place at the right time. Hmm. Um, that's probably one. Number two, I think I'm, you know, all my efforts, I'm a freelancer, right? I do a little bit of this, a little bit of that. And, uh, it's, you know, the, the cookbook's out now, there might be some in the future. Um, I'm having some discussions with some publishers about some ideas now. So that's happening, which is exciting. Hmm. But another thing is the curatorialist. I want to, I want to publish a paper magazine. Nice. Man. I want to, you know, a hardback. Um, I, you know, when you go to Indigo or Chapters or whatever, I want it to be there on the shelf and I, like I want that. it to be homegrown. I like that. I want it to be like 100% GMO free organic Vancouver. And I want it to be a little bit like a little bad, you know, yeah. like a little badass in terms of disposition. Tattoos and knives. Yeah. I mean, I want to get into art direction a little bit. Okay. You know, I, I do these things well, photography, design, whatever, but writing as well. But I, I want to, so if there's any art directors out there, please get in touch. Yeah, look them um, up. You know, a little bit of art direction where, you know, the especially the imagery mm-hmm. and uh, it is a bit more curated, so right. to speak. So cool. that, that's, that excites me because that really brings you up to another level when you have art direction for a shoot. Like now I'm more candid, right? I right. just walk around, yeah. I take pictures and it's honest, it's truthful. Mm-hmm. But with some art direction, I think you can just kind of blow it out of the water. Yeah, you can still be truthful and you can still be real. Exactly. But it just has a little more of a... Yeah, a, a, just a little bit more polished. Maybe. Yeah, and that comes up for me a lot. Of, and, and the consulting work that I do in, in restaurants is I try to say like this is, there's this box and within this box your role is a very small part. The rest of that space is just for you to be you and you to play and make that your, make that your own. Yeah. And I feel like that's where we, I want to see us get to as a food culture in this city is like, as long as we're covering these bases, we're good. You have all this space to just do what you want to do. Like you said, put it on the menu. And if the first critic doesn't like it, keep it on the menu. So I applaud you for. And, and by the way, I mean the day the day of like critics making or breaking restaurants oh, is, is yeah. over, man. Yeah. Because people, guess what? People don't read newspapers anymore. <laughs> so those kind of critics, nobody gives a shit. Yeah, exactly. Um, I mean, of course, chefs still do very much. Yeah. But you know, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna base my restaurant experience on a on a review any longer. Yeah. Plus, you have all these uh, you know influencers and whatever that do your marketing for you, kind yeah. of. Yeah. Um, and, and I think, I don't know, I mean, I don't think, I don't know about your experiences, but seldom in mine have, have chefs like blatantly said, you know, fuck critics. They never say that. No, God, no. <laughs> they could be like rock no. stars, badasses, yeah. you know, whatever, uh, you know, 
but they would never they no. still they still don't they still keep yeah. keep to themselves with regards to what they think about critics and whatever yeah. and everybody knows what they think right oh yeah they think it's you know they're busting their ass and this person comes in and writes a shitty review and you know yeah i, think, I get it i okay. think i think that's the the glaring difference in the gap between something like the book that you've done and curated and and an article after uh, a 90 minute exposure to a restaurant you just really don't know and it's so unfair to to be so critical when someone probably broke their back trying to turn the lights on in that place and yeah. then you come in and just shit all over it yeah but the thing is like you know in, in terms of a critic's point of view in terms of what the critic is thinking mm. they're like oh you open a restaurant you're up for scrutiny sorry true and i, I you know I, what i mean I, if you're yeah. in this league if yeah. you're playing this game i yeah. can come in and say whatever i want and publish that and and you know what the, they'd be right i mean oh you totally know, I mean, i'm not against that it's kind of like you know you watch a soccer game and you you rip apart the players and the coach exactly. and if they're making this much money and employing this many people and if this is a club <laughs> and i'm a fan and i'm buying your jerseys exactly and your you know your your bed sheets with logos and whatever <laughs> crests on them then yeah i can say this player is shitty i don't yeah. want him in the team yeah and I can say, you know, I can rip them apart. And that yeah. gives me that right. I just think it's just a, a conversation of how much weight does that thing carry? Do you of know course. what I mean? It doesn't need to shut a restaurant down. And of course, I mean, most of these, some of these reviews are pretty like, like they go to extra lengths to make it like flowery. And like they, you know, there's also like, it's an art to ripping somebody apart. <laughs> Do you know what I mean, man? Right. Like they're, they're, you know, the way they like phrase things and stuff with like scathing, you know, like a scathing <laughs> review. Like it's, it's just the words they use and how like literary it is. And it's just like, when I read it, like I get destroyed <laughs> and, and I'm like, oh, I wonder what the chef's thinking. Right. Cause it's just like, they're so eloquent when they're tearing you an asshole. It's like, <laughs> man, like, you know, at least just write it with like, you know, basic <laughs> vocabulary. <laughs> anyway. You know. uh, on that note, I want to take a minute to celebrate you and say, thank you so much for doing what you do for penning this book, for taking beautiful photos and taking the time uh, I say it usually at the start of this podcast, but I'll say it here at the end that I'm a true believer that time is the most valuable thing that you and I have. And you've dedicated the last uh, 71 minutes and 31 seconds to me and these listeners. And you dedicated eight months, if not more, to this book. So I applaud you for that. And I will continue to do whatever I can do to support you, this project, and the ones that will follow. And I look forward to partnering with you somehow, some way, and becoming the anarchist that we feel this industry needs. Let's do it, man. Let's let the let's let the partnership transcend yeah. this this guest lounge. I like it. I like it. If people, <laughs> thank you so much. No, man, my absolute pleasure. Thanks for coming on. If people do want to reach out to you and touch base personally, how best they do that? Just uh, thecuratorialist.com. Perfect. Yeah. And, uh, and I, hoping, hoping that you can spell that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the curatorialist.com or just, uh, you know, my Instagram, uh, curatorialist. I'm always on there. So if you DM me or whatever. Perfect. This just came, this came to me at the start of the show, but I, I just remembered now is I, I don't know how or when, but I feel like the curatorialist should also be a podcast as well. Just saying that, I'm just going to put that out there. Yeah. You can chew on if, it. If, 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 if we ever do it, you'll be my first guest. <laughs> Love it. Yeah. Love it. And I'll be asking the questions. Ooh, <laughs> I'm sweating already. Uh, thank you guys so much for tuning in as you do week after week and supporting the show. If it wasn't for you guys, this would not exist. I appreciate and love you all. Thank you, uh, Hawken, for coming on and sharing again all of your stories and your um, knowledge because it, it really does matter and what you're doing matters. So thanks again, man. I appreciate it. That's it, guys. You know what to do until next time. Be good and do good. That's it, dude. We did it. Thank you. Well done. Thanks, Brad. <laughs>